Hello everybody, my name is Alex Merced. I'm a developer advocate here at Dremio, and welcome to this Apache Iceberg 101 presentation. The who, the what, and the why of Apache Iceberg. I am a developer advocate here at Dremio. I've worked all over in web and in data. I've spoken at events like Data Day Texas, OSACon, P99 Conf, Data Council, written libraries in Python and JavaScript. I'm a co-author on this Apache Iceberg the Definitive Guide, which you can get an early copy by scanning that QR code and the host of several podcasts like the ones you see here, which you can subscribe to on Spotify and iTunes. Not only Data Waves, a weekly broadcast from Dremio where we have different people come in and present about the Data Lake House. Select Star from Data Lake, a joint podcast with my counterpart, developer advocate at Dremio Depankar Mazumdar, and Data Nation, which is a solo podcast I do where I just talk about uh, any cool data stuff that uh, comes to mind. Uh, all these can be found on Spotify and iTunes. But let's start getting into our feature presentation by talking about first, what is a data lake? Because if we want to understand what Apache Iceberg is, we need to understand the evolution from a data lake. Okay, and a data lake is essentially a repository of structured and unstructured data. So yes, there are databases and there are data warehouses, but they generally hold structured data, data that is structured into sort of columns and rows. But we have like audio data, uh, IoT data, a bunch of data that necessarily doesn't fit into a nice nifty structure or a semi-structured uh, like JSON data uh, that doesn't necessarily always fit in tidally into databases and data warehouses. So what happens is that we said, let's try to have a place where we can put all this data, okay? A big repository of this data was essentially a big hard drive for this data. And that could be a like Hadoop cluster where you basically have a bunch of computers networked together using the Hadoop software to act as sort of one large hard drive. You could be using cloud storage like Amazon S3, which is referred uh, that styles referred to as object storage. Okay, where basically, you know, the actual storage is abstracted by a layer of metadata objects that contain metadata about the things that are saved in the cloud and you interact with those metadata objects to access the files. Um, either way, you're just basically having a lot of files, but people don't want to interact with files. It's just more tricky because what if you have, if you have a thousand files that make up a particular data set, well, then everyone has to sit there and say, okay, hey, I'm gonna scan these thousand files and they gotta list the files out. And what happens if they miss a file? So then you have inconsistent versions of the data. You generally don't want to do that. You would prefer to do it in the way we do it in database and data warehouses where we use things like SQL or Python and we interact not with files, but with tables. And tables basically are an abstraction over the files. Okay, so there could, that data could be in one file, thousand files, but it, we just know it as a particular table. And that is the purpose of a table format. A table format brings that layer of abstraction that you don't see in databases and data warehouses, but brings it to the data lake. Okay, so that way you can see the layer with all the files stored on your favorite storage layer. But then there's this metadata layer that allows us to say, okay, hey, these files over here are better known as table A. And these files over here are known as table B. Okay, and different table formats achieve this differently. Okay, so in the old days, okay, you would use Hive and basically Hive, the way it tracked tables was by directory. So basically in the Hive Metastore, so the metadata that Hive would track, it would say for table A, well, all the files, all the data for table A is in the table A folder and any partitions um, that that table had were also tracked in that meta Metastore as, okay, this folder, this folder, this folder, this folder, and generally the folders are named after the partition value they represent. So I'll say, okay, this folder is based on a partitioning on the field of field and anytime a record has a value of one, those files are those files are gonna be in this folder, those files are gonna be this folder, and so forth. And that worked, that worked just fine. The only problem is since you're only tracking it in the metadata at the partition level, that becomes your unit of asset transactions. So if you wanted to update one record, you'd have to update and swap out a whole partition. Okay, you'd have to update things at one partition at a time. You couldn't atomically swap out two partitions. Um, you're doing, but basically, even if I knew which partitions I wanted to scan, the engine would still have to figure out, hey, what files are in this directory and would have to do a file listing operation and then iterate through those files uh, to do the scan, okay? Which can be a lot more time consuming to do all those file listing operations. So 
Well, this worked, there was a lot of ways it could be improved upon. So modern formats have moved away from focusing on directories to focusing on the specific files that make up the table, where their metadata now tracks the individual files that make up the table in different ways. Okay, and here's a high level example. Just imagine that we just had a list and say, these are the files in table A. Okay, doesn't matter where they're particularly located at, just these are the files. These are the files in table B. Okay, and then maybe some other stats co-located with a list of files that allows us to know, hey, like data on its partitioning fields so that way we can use this metadata to begin narrowing down which files we really want to scan. Okay, and this approach of modern table formats brings a bunch of benefits like time travel because this enables, since you can crap, cra capture um, snapshots of these metadata uh, of this list of files, what you can do is you can say, you know what, I don't want to scan the latest snapshot. I want to scan a previous snapshot and scan the table as it was with the files that made up the table at the time. Okay, so you can do time traveling. You can do schema evolution because oftentimes the schema of the table is tracked in the metadata. Okay, so then you can update the table, update what the schema is in the table, and basically the engine can then make sure to apply the schema that's in the metadata to the data that it loads from all the files, regardless of what schema the specific files were written with. Uh, asset transactions, it will be able to uh, consistently um, write the data across multiple partitions, a single partition, a single row, with, with asset guarantees and performantly. Okay, now one very big table format in this space uh, that is taking the world by storm is Apache Iceberg. Okay, and what it is, it's a specification and libraries. So again, different formats have a different scope to their project. Apache Iceberg basically focuses on one specific thing, a specification. It's a standard rules of how the metadata is written and how it should be read. Okay, that specification, any tool can adopt. It's basically creating a universal language to talk to data on the data lake. Okay, and basically in the aims of being a universal language, it aims to sort of be neutral um, as a format in sort of like the competitions between tooling, trying to be sort of like the most used tool on, on the data lake or data lake house. Because again, table formats with the, these new advanced table formats basically take your data lake and enable it with a lot of these features you'd only expect on data warehouses to create what's called a data lake house. Uh, along with the specification, the standard Apache Iceberg also has libraries that either fall, fall sort of two different categories. One, they are libraries to either enable the usage of Iceberg in open source uh, tools like Spark and Flink, okay? Or they are libraries um, that allow other tools to more easily take advantage of Apache Iceberg, to build that support for Apache Iceberg. Okay, so this would be like the, the Apache Iceberg um, Java and Python APIs. So if I'm writing a, a query engine in Java, okay, when it comes to writing and reading Apache Iceberg metadata, I can use the Apache Iceberg Java API and then pass the listing of files of the query plan to you know my Parquet readers to read the Parquet files afterwards or something like that, okay? Bottom line is the idea is it's more about enabling and not trying to be the end all be all. So basically the Apache Iceberg project does not venture into the realm of like services of trying to create, hey, here's the service you deploy to manage your tables. Instead, it has uh, libraries that have maintenance procedures and optimization procedures that you can create services from, okay? Or use them as a model implementation to build your own implementation from. And it enables third-party services that kind of fill the gap and when you don't want to build your own services like a Dremio Arctic or a tabular um, to optimize your tables. Okay, now who created it? It was created at Netflix. Okay, why? To deal with a lot of those challenges we talked about earlier that was with those sort of older directory-based formats. Okay, and essentially the way it works is that you have a catalog. The catalog can be one of many different mechanisms. So that's generally sort of like the most sort of not set in stone thing about this. Like you get to choose from a lot of different possible catalogs. Okay, but what the catalog does is really one specific job. It's going to list the table. So in this case, it knows about table A and table B, but specifically the catalog knows which metadata file is the newest one. Because every time the table changes, a new metadata file gets created 
representing sort of the state of the table or like the the schema, the structure of the table at the time. Um, so every time a table changes, a new metadata file is created and then the catalog is updated with that to now point, say, hey, this table belongs to that metadata file. And that's how it maintains consistency because basically on, only when a transaction is complete does that update to the catalog happen. Okay, so basically if the transaction is complete or it is not, and then if it's not, that catalog will not be updated. Okay, that's kind of how we enable uh, asset transactions here. Okay, so the metadata file is the high level of the table. So like, hey, what is the table schema? What is the table's partitioning scheme? What are the lists of historical snapshots of the table? So it's that high level data that then the engine can then use to conduct partition pruning, to uh, enforce the schema on the data that it reads from the files. Now, once it reads a metadata file, it's going to want to determine which snapshot we're going to query. And each snapshot gets one of these manifest list files, which is basically not a list of files. It's sort of an in-between that says, okay, at this point in time, there's these groups of files called manifests. And one or more of manifests can make up a particular snapshot of the table. Okay, so this manifest list lists which groups of files make up the snapshot. Okay, and then also has partition stats and other stats to, on those groups of files. So right there, we can start doing partition printing and saying, hey, this group of files is not needed for this query. This group of files is not needed for this query. And right there, you're starting to reduce the number of files you have to scan, reducing, which is going to increase the speed of the query. And then once you've narrowed down to which manifests are relevant to your query, you would then go down to the manifest level, which does list the individual files okay, with metadata on those files. And then you can start saying, okay, well, this file, this particular file does not is not relevant to my query. This particular file is not relevant to my query. So just based on the metadata file, you can skip all the irrelevant data files to your particular query and only scan the data files that actually matter, that actually will have records relevant to your query. Okay, and that's what this metadata tree that Apache Iceberg uses uh, a lot, a lot enables. And also, again, it's also structured to enable reuse. Because see, these manifests can then be reused from snapshot to snapshot instead of having to kind of always rewrite new things every time. Now, I highly recommend that one of the best ways to learn Apache Iceberg is to get hands-on with Apache Iceberg. So if you scan this QR code here, this will take you to a YouTube playlist where you can get hands-on uh, with Apache Iceberg and run some exercises on your laptop. So you'll create like a little mini data lake house on your laptop. So that way there's no cloud cost, no cloud infrastructure, just you kind of having this nice little test environment where you can try out... Um, uh, iceberg in a lot of different ways. Okay. And then this article over here is going to have lots of links to tutorials, videos, uh, talks, all about Apache iceberg. So basically a one, not stop, one stop shop for, uh, all sorts of resources when it comes to Apache iceberg. So make sure to scan those, check those out. The links will also be in the video description, but Apache iceberg also has several features. Okay. Such as again, asset guarantees. And the way it does that is through the catalogs. Cause remember the catalog basically is a listing of each table and where the current metadata.json is. Okay, and again, that only gets updated after the transaction is complete. So either the transaction happens or it doesn't. Again, those asset guarantees, those atomicity guarantees. Okay, to make sure they're atomic. Okay, so you're gonna get that, which is something that was very difficult to achieve in the data lake beforehand. You're gonna get schema evolution, where again, the table metadata determines what is the current schema of the table, regardless of what schema the actual data was written in. The engine will read the data and then apply the schema uh, of the table at the time based on the snapshot that's being queried and then return you the data in the correct schema. So it keeps the schema uh, consistent. Okay, the schema, and then also the schema can change without you having to rewrite all the data. Okay, because without this metadata layer, what would happen is that if you want to change the schema, you'd have to go then rewrite all the old data files not just the new data files, okay? So this basically ends up also, again, saving a lot of money and having to do uh, unnecessary rewrites or not having to do immediate rewrites when you're in the middle of making changes, okay? Improve performance, because again, the engine can use the metadata to plan the queries. You're not doing these file listing operations. Instead, it's only gonna scan the files that it needs to scan because going through the metadata, it can say, hey, these are all the files in the table, but based on the metadata, those partition stats, 
at the manifest level or those stats at the individual file level, we can determine that, hey, these are the only files that matter for my query. And the less files you scan, the faster the query is, but also the cheaper the query is because if you scan less, you need less compute. So you can close, shut down those, those, those in, uh, instances much quicker, leading to cheaper queries and cheaper compute costs. There's partition evolution, which is a unique feature to Apache Iceberg. Okay, so essentially here, you might have a table that's right now being partitioned by month. Okay, so basically you're grouping files by, by month, but you're starting to get in more data, and now you'd like to start grouping them by day. You can change that without having to rewrite the old data that's partitioned by month. It's just new data going forward will be partitioned in the new scheme, and the metadata knows which files were written with which partitioning scheme, which will allow the engine to properly plan and say, okay, hey, based on the files that were partitioned by month, let's you know do our filter on that. And then specifically on the, the, the data that's filtered by day or partitioned by day, we'll do a separate plan for that and still be able to create a efficient query plan. Okay, so you don't have to rewrite the table just because you want to update the way your table partitions the files going forward. Okay, and if you choose to, you can always rewrite the old data if you want, but it is not, you're no, it's not like you're obligated anymore. Another really amazing feature is hidden partitioning. And to really appreciate hidden partitioning, you need to see the way it was done in the past. Okay, so let's say we have this timestamp column, right? You think that the timestamp column is enough because it captures the time that things happened. But I want to partition the data based on month and say, okay, hey, all the data that was ingested, you know, that, that occurred has a timestamp within this month is in this bucket, in the next bucket, and so forth. The problem is that the way older hive tables worked is that it was always partitioned based on the raw value of the field. And the problem with the timestamp, you might be capturing milliseconds, nanoseconds. So each unique value for that timestamp could end up creating way too many partitions with way too few files, creating, you know, not basically partition that's not going to help you at all. So what you would do is you would add an additional column that represents your partitioned, your partitioned, the transformed value. So in this case, month. And then every time you ingest the data, you'd have to make sure to transform the timestamp data for that month column. And then if I just query the table solely based on the timestamp column, that's not the partition field. So I'd end up scanning the whole table, which would be really expensive. So in order for me to benefit from that partitioning, I would have to make sure to include a second predicate that based on that month column. And as you can see, this is kind of redundant because technically doesn't that timestamp already cover month one through four, but because of the way it works, we'd have to do this additional predicate. And you as a data analyst, would have to be aware of adding that predicate. And if you're a data engineer, you'd have to be like aware of making sure you transform that data every time throughout the ingestion. So with Iceberg, we make this all much simpler. Okay. Instead, what you can do is you apply a transform on the column. So what you're saying, telling the metadata to do is say, we're not partitioning based on the raw value of the field, but on the value of the field after you after you apply this built-in transformed or transform function. So in this case, it'll turn the timestamp and turn it into a month or, you know, there's a day, there's an hour, there's a whole bunch of different possible transforms. But in this case, you don't have to create an additional column. So you're not storing additional data in those parquet files. Okay. All that transform value is stored in the metadata file, in the metadata where it'll be used to do the actual query planning. And then so basically easier for the data engineer, but also easier for the data analyst because they don't have to add that extra query. So they don't even need to know that there's this transform thing or how the tables partition. They can just do what's an intuitive query and get the benefit of the partitioning. So really, really cool feature. Okay, so those are a nice tour of some of the features of Apache Iceberg and what Apache Iceberg is. So hopefully this has made what Apache Iceberg is a, a lot clearer, a lot, a lot more interesting. And the next step is for you to get hands on so you can actually see it at work. Essentially what it does just makes your data lake feel like a database. Like that's really the end goal. Okay. That basically working with your data lake should feel the same as working with a database or data warehouse. Thus the whole idea of a data lake house. So again, you can get hands on by doing the exercises over here. And you can find all sorts of articles on things like migration, uh, security, all sorts of really good stuff by going over to this uh, article over here. 
And again, subscribe to these podcasts over there on Spotify and iTunes. But otherwise, I hopefully you guys enjoyed this presentation. Leave a like, leave a comment. I'll see you all around. Again, this is Alex, developer advocate at Tremio. See you all.